Greetings, my name is Jeffrey M. Ward. We're here today on August 15th, 2008 in Greenville, Tennessee at Milligan and Coleman and we're in the Coleman Conference Room to interview Nat R. Coleman Jr. This is part of the Legal History Project for the Fellows of the Tennessee Bar Foundation. Mr. Coleman, if you would uh, start out by telling us your full name, please. My full name is uh, Nathaniel Ragsdale Coleman, Jr. And what is your date of birth? November the 9th, 1922. Where were you born? I was born in uh, Hamburg, Germany. And certainly uh, being born in Germany is something that is unusual in this day and age. How did you end up being born in Germany? Oh, gosh, that's a long story. <laughs> uh, my father was a, a tobacco merchant, and uh, uh, he uh, had an office in Hamburg. And my mother, who was British, uh, was visiting uh, some friends in Hamburg, and at a social gathering, uh, they met. And uh, one thing led to another, and I guess marriage was next, and my birth was one year exactly, or nine months exactly thereafter. <laughs> Were your parents living in Germany at that time? Yeah, my father was, uh, well, you know, we'd, he'd come over here every once in a while, but, but he had an office and, and was living in Germany. And, and your father's name, of course, was Nathaniel Ragsdale Coleman Sr. Right. You mentioned that he was in the uh, tobacco business. What exactly did he do? Well, he was a, a tobacco merchant. Uh, in those days, his customers were mostly <coughs> German manufacturers, and the uh, the uh, the taste in Germany and in Europe at that time was for Oriental cigarettes. So what he'd do is uh, he had uh, a couple of plants, one in Greece and one in Bulgaria, uh, where he bought tobacco, and uh, they manipulated the tobacco after it was bought packed it in bales, <clears throat> and then he stored it either in Greece or in Germany, and then he peddled it to customers, to manufacturers of cigarettes. Did that job require him to travel a lot? Oh, yes. He was gone all the time. That's why my brother and I went off to school when we were so young. Where was your father from originally? Halifax County, Virginia. And you mentioned your mother was a British citizen? Yes. Uh, did she work? No. Uh, I believe she had a talent, though, didn't she? Yes, she did. She had a, a, a beautiful voice. So did she actually sing professionally? Not. She sang in, in a few productions uh, in Dresden. <clears throat> but uh, my father made her quit because at that time uh, there was this problem. Most of the artistic people, you know, the directors and, and, and other artists were we were Jewish and this Hitler thing was coming along and my father didn't want to get mixed up in that. And, uh, you know, so, so, so he, he, he just made her quit. The, the few times that she was involved in professional productions, what type of music was she involved with? Operatic. You Operatic or operettas. You mentioned that uh, as a result of his business and what he did, he was traveling a lot, which uh, ended up leaving you and your brother to uh, schooling, sort of a, bo uh, was it a boarding school type situation? Oh, yes. We went to school in England. <clears throat> Who was your brother? John Eric Coleman. Was he older or younger than you? One year younger. And did you and he go to school uh, at the same place? Uh, at first we did. Um, he was four and I was five. So you actually started boarding school at five years of age? In England. Okay. And what, what was that school? Uh, Rocklands in Hastings on the coast of England, not far from Dover. Uh, I, I'm not familiar with the boarding school atmosphere in England and I suspect others viewing or not. How is that set up and how, how does the boarding school situation uh, take place? <laughs> That's a long story, but uh, the first school we went to was was, was, was for youngsters, so this wouldn't be the typical boarding school. But, you know, in England they call the private schools public schools. 
uh, and uh, of course, masters, no women, uh, no women students either. And uh, there wasn't any such thing as, as graduation, it was unheard of, the word graduation, or you were the class of so-and-so was unheard of. Uh, now you lift, lift it to, uh, and, and, and alumnus was unheard of. Uh, you were an old boy after you left the school. And so then you join the old boys club, and then the list of students who, 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 who are old boys it says left. See, I left in 1939. <laughs> so how long did you actually remain in school in England? Well, from the time I was five until uh, 19, 1939. <clears throat> I just finished the uh, school certificate exam, which was a year's prep preparation for the exam, and if you passed it, you were eligible to go to a university. Uh, and they had different types of school certificate exams. Uh, the one that I went to, if I'd passed, which I did, thank God, would have qualified me to go to Oxford or Cambridge, University of London, University of Edinburgh, I think. And I, you know, things were, were, were squeaky in, in Europe, but uh, um, I thought I'd come back for the sixth form. And in England, you just go to the university three years, not four like you do here. But you spend one extra year uh, at the, what you'd call the grade school, uh, we call the public school level. So you started out at age five in one boarding school, and then did you transfer to another at some point? Yeah, before I transferred completing? to Abbott's Home, which was the last school I, I went to when I was about to, uh, I'm not sure exactly. I think I was probably eight or nine and stayed there until I was 16. So during that time from age eight or nine to 16, you would have been at the same school, Abbott's home? Yes. Uh, I've heard at, at some point some stories about events at Abbott's home. Um, tell us a little bit about Abbott's home and some of your good memories from that. Well. <laughs> Actually, you know, I didn't know until I came to William and Mary <clears throat> how bad I was off at Abbott's Home. I mean, the food was horrible, you can't imagine. <laughs> For breakfast, you get a bowl of porridge and all the tea you could drink, and, uh, but it was a, a very tight-knit uh, community, uh, very strict. You got caned uh, if you committed a major offense, and, uh, and um, I got a few. Uh, six was the maximum they, they could give you, and uh, you knew, you know, if you were going to get caned, the the, the 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 magic word was the master would say to you, "Come to my study." <laughs> you knew you were going to get it. <laughs> were those words that you heard once or twice? I heard them once or twice. Yes. <laughs> did Did you ever receive the maximum offense? No, no. Uh, but but the worst part was that you know you'd go into the master's study, close the door. And your school chums would hear that, and they knew you were going to get a cane, caning. So you were in the master's study, and he'd say, bend over that chair. And then behind you, you could see him test out the various uh, switches. You know, he had long, short, stubby ones. He'd hit them into his hand, and he'd have long ones that he'd switch through the air, and he'd pick out the appropriate weapon. And uh, then he'd give you what he thought was appropriate. But the secret was you could not let your school chum see you cry. So there was this crowd of boys around the door uh, as you left, and you had to go through there and brush your lip and go down the hall and then go into a bathroom and close the door and you cry all you want to. Was there a time at any point that you received some type of alternative punishment for an offense? <coughs> Yes, the last year I was there. Uh, Tell us that story. Well, I, I loved sports, and uh, I played rugger. Uh, I played wing three-quarter. And what is rugger? Rugby. Oh, rugby, okay. And uh, then I played tennis, and um, I was wicketkeeper uh, on the first 11 for cricket. And uh, we used to play uh, about once a month. Uh, a village team, which would be in the evening, and this would be some local village, and would be the butcher, 
the baker and the lawyer and the banker and the doctor and so forth. And uh, you know, in England, it's much further north than we are, so it would stay light until late. We could play from, we started about five o'clock, play out until about 10.30. And then afterwards, they'd have a little refreshments for the village team and beer and hard cider. I found out that hard cider has a little more alcohol in it than I thought it did. And then there was punch for, for, the, for the boys. And we, of course, were supposed to, to drink the punch. But anyway, Potter and I got into the, uh, into the uh, hard cider. Was Potter another young man that went to school at Abbotstown? My best friend, who was killed during World War II. Anyway, uh, we were walking back to school, and uh, <clears throat> we were talking about the the, the servants who uh, one of the servants who lived on the third floor of the building, and uh, the boys we nicknamed her Tuppence Halfpenny. <laughs> we thought we could. <laughs> By her favors for two and a half pennies, she was a village girl. <laughs> so we decided to visit Tuppence Hapney up on the third floor. And the big, old, must have been 150 years old, ivy bush or something that went up the wall of the building. And we were going up there just like going up step ladders. And we got up to the third floor and had these casement windows there. And uh, just as we got to the top, we heard rat a tat tat a rat a tat tat and, of course, it was the head. <laughs> and you say the head. Are you talking about the headmaster? Head master, yes. Uh, and his name was, um, his name was C.H.C. Sharp. And uh, he drove a station wagon, which in England was called a shooting brake. And he must have had eyes in the back of his head. But you know, in England, they drive on the left so, of the road, so the steering wheel's on the right. And he turned his spotlight on on the right, and it walked across the floor from where he stopped, and it walked up that ivy that we climbed up in. <laughs> First thing it had us in full focus. So down we came, <clears throat> and the head told us, this, I want to see you in my study tomorrow, which would have been Saturday at 10 o'clock. So at 10 o'clock, Potter and I, uh, his name was Jerry, Gerald, and, and uh, uh, we didn't have many fancy bathroom facilities. Uh, really, the facilities were quite crude. And each pot had a, each bed had a pot under it, which you used uh, to urinate if you wanted to go to the bathroom. And, and, and they were called, called, called potters of pots. <laughs> and his name was, was or Jerry Potts, I think. And that's why we called Jerry Potter. Anyway, uh, <coughs> Jerry and I thought we were going to get caned. So the next morning, Saturday, we went up to the headmaster's office. And a very stern look, too, and he said, follow me. So we went down the steps again to the garage, and he looked at this shooting brake, and he says, get in. So we got in the back seat, and he drove out in the country into the most lonely, <laughs> miserable part of the world I've ever seen. There wasn't a sight of civilization, not a, nothing. I mean, you couldn't see a house, you couldn't see a barn. There wasn't a, a farm animal. There was nothing except these stone walls that they used to divide fields of, of property. And so he must have been oh, about 20 miles from school and uh, <clears throat> said, all right, now get out and get back the best way you can. So he drove off and Potter and I looked at each other and said, what do we do now? And first thing we had, rat a tat tat rat a tat tat rat a tat tat <laughs> Around the corner came this lorry, which had a metal bed on it, and he was carrying empty you know, milk cans, what was this, 10 gallons or 20 gallons? And uh, we waved our hands, and, and the uh, driver stopped. He spoke with this broad Yorkshire accent. He says, Lottis, I said, what can I do for you? <laughs> we told him the predicament that we were in. He, he says, come on. I says, I'll give you a ride back to school. So we got in there and <clears throat> he started back towards Abbott's home. And first thing we saw the headmaster just driving along. <laughs> we said, could you pass him? 
said, yes, just get down. So he got down and accelerated. And I'll tell you what, those milk cans made a racket too when they passed the headmaster. <laughs> and and uh, so he passed him and, and, and he took us to Abbott's home. And anyway, for him to get to his garage, he had to go below a driveway, below a lawn, and then go to the back of the school. And uh, this is the headmaster to get to, to get, get back to there. his garage, yes. And so <clears throat> Potter and I got a cricket ball. We knew the headmaster would be coming soon. <clears throat> and so when we saw the headmaster come, we were just throwing the cricket ball to each other, wave to him. <laughs> and that, that's the last we heard of that. <laughs> Now, now we've been, when we've been talking to you, we've noticed that you really don't have an English accent. Did you have one at some point? Oh, yes. Yes, my nickname at William & Mary was Limey. So when you, when you came to America to go to school, you actually had that accent, brought a, that accent a with broad, you? A broad uh, uh, British accent, and I made it my business to try to get rid of it. Uh, it took a while, but I've had plenty of time to do it. When you were in boarding school, did you stay uh, in England or Europe the whole time, or did you come to the United States at times? No, we came to the United States uh, most every year. Uh, sometimes there was an occasion why we didn't, but we had a, a summer place in Gloucester County, Virginia, uh, which was on Mob Jack Bay, which goes down to Chesapeake Bay. <clears throat> and uh, it was a wonderful place. and, and and the difference between that and, 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 and boarding school in England was, was just like night and day, too. <clears throat> anyway, my Aunt Mary lived there, and uh, my father had a house, and uh, had a sailboat, uh, and uh, we went swimming and crabbing and got soft-shell crabs and did all the things that boys love to do, and had, had, just had a wonderful time. Then back to England to a completely different life. i never forget the first hot dog I ever had in my life. <laughs> they put the son of a, of a local farmer kind of in charge of us, and his name was, his nickname was Punk, Punk Vaughn. And so he took us to Gloucester Courthouse and took us to a place where he could get a hot dog for a nickel. <laughs> that means the bun, the relish, <laughs> and everything. The first hot dog I'd ever had in my life, and I thought it was the most, most delicious thing there ever was. Oh, golly, was it good. During those years when you were coming, uh, usually in the summertime, to the United States, what was the, the atmosphere in Europe, and especially in Germany? What was going on there? Well, I don't know that I really, I really saw much or, or knew much. Uh, things. The, the economy seemed to be very, very good. Uh, stores were busy, restaurants were busy, uh, people were well-dressed, uh, you know, um, facially, on the surface, er everything seemed to be just perfect. Is, and was that in Europe that it appeared that way? I'm talking about Germany especially. Germany especially. Yeah, yeah, in England, uh, they weren't getting along as well. See, the cotton business had gone to hell, and and uh, the mill, the the town near near Abbott somewhere I went to school, not the town, the village was was called Roaster, and the only thing that sustained that village was a cotton mill that was driven by water by a big water mill wheel, and uh, uh, finally they electrified it, but it was out of business a lot of the time. And when it was, there wasn't anything else for those people to do then. They were very poor. There was a point uh, sometime in your boyhood years that you got to go to the Olympics. Yeah. Uh, tell us about that. Well, really it was, I, I think I should start before we get to the Olympics. Uh, we were in, uh, I think it was Easter vacation in 1936, and uh, we were staying, we were living in Dresden. My mother and father, they usually lived in hotels. He traveled so much, and he and my mother together traveled so much 
that they never, they never had a home. Uh, I never had a, a home. And uh, so we, my brother and I, uh, and the chauffeur and my mother, went shopping. And when we came back to the hotel, the Atlantic Hotel, uh, which was right on the river and looked out over the, the Baroque, the famous Dresden architecture, the uh, opera house and the Frauenkirche, the Damenkirche, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, there were these three or four lines of black-shirted soldiers standing there in front of the hotel. So the chauffeur let us out, and uh, he went on to the garage, and we kind of <laughs> threw the soldiers like this. <laughs> Got to the hotel, and my, my mother went to the desk to get the key, the room key, and my brother and I went to the elevator, and we stood next to the elevator, but next to the elevator were standing two black-shirted soldiers you know, with their guns down there, and, and right opposite a hall that was not as, certainly no wider than this room, was a picture of Hitler, a portrait of Hitler that used to fascinate us because the eyes would follow you, and as you went down the hall, you know how portraits do. <laughs> so we stood there, and first thing, boom, boom, the guns went like this, the door to the elevator opened, out came Hitler, behind him Goering, behind him Goebbels. <laughs> so they were staying at the hotel there, or maybe had a meeting at the hotel, I don't know. And, 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 and I certainly didn't follow them, and, and that's the last I saw them. But you were about 14 at that point, and certainly knew who Hitler was? About 14, yes. And that, um, was that in the same time frame then that you got that to go to in, the Olympics? In the same year, in, in 1936. Uh, um, we went to the Olympic Games, and there was a, a section there for the, for the Americans, or at least where Americans ended up. And uh, it was sort of in the middle of the stadium, where, where the uh, distance runners came into the stadium. They would, that would be to our left, and the flame would have been to our right at the end, other end of the stadium. And behind us, not over 150 feet was Hitler's box. Uh, you know, where he sat and Goering and whoever his guests were. And uh, whenever a German athlete won, he'd march in front of the box and give the salute and Hitler stand up <laughs> and salute him back. Well, by the time that the long jump came, Jesse Owens, who'd already won four goals by that time, never recognized by Hitler, uh, was engaged in the, in, in the long jump uh, against, in the finals for the, they were jumping for the gold and the silver. And uh, he was jumping against a German by the name of uh, Lang, L-A-N-G-E. And uh, Lang jumped first and Jesse Owens was second. And Jesse Owens was, was not very tall, but gosh, he was, he was, he was just like a, like a panther the way he walked. He was so well coordinated. And so uh, Lang ran down the cinder runway to the board, which he was supposed to use to jump off into the sawdust pit. And the big cheer went up in the stadium and they announced that he had broken the Olympic record. And so Jesse Owens was next. He ran down the cinder track, overstepped the mark, foul, grown from the small American sake. Uh, so then it was Lang's second jump, and he ran down there, and this huge cheer came up from the stadium. And it was announced that he had broken the uh, former Olympic record and the world record. And Jesse Owens ran down there, overstepped the mark again. And as you can imagine, there was silence from the section that we were sitting in. Well, on the third jump, Lang made a mediocre jump. Jesse Owens went down there. I mean, he came down there. He hit that mark perfectly. And while he was in the air, you could tell that he'd, 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 he'd won by at least this much. It, it was incredible. A huge cheer went up. A small cheer went up from a small section. And... <laughs> 
So you got to go fast forward from here uh, to about 19, in, in the 70s sometime. I don't remember exactly when. But I had to take a deposition in Knoxville. And uh, I thought I'd go there the night before, stay at a motel and not have to drive from Greenville uh, and be refreshed when I took the deposition. So I went to this motel and uh, I saw signs for some meeting of some organization. And it was ob obvious that Jesse Owens was involved in that. So I didn't pay much attention. Went down to the dining room for dinner. The place kind of dark and almost empty, except at one corner there was a big table and about 11 or 12 people sitting around it and they were all black. And uh, I said, well, I'm sure that's Jesse Owens over there. So I got up from where I was sitting and walked over there and introduced myself to Jesse Owens. I said, I apologize for breaking in on your meeting here, but, but aren't you Jesse Owens? And he said, yes. And I said, well, I saw you at the 1936 Olympics. And he seemed glad that I remembered it. I said, tell me something. I've, I've often wondered, what in the world happened to that fellow Lang that you were jumping against? He said, well, he said, after the war was over, I had to go to Hamburg uh, for some reason. That's where Lang was from. And I visited his family. And I asked them. And they told me that uh, he had been conscripted by the German army, been sent to the Russian front, and was killed. Wasn't that a decent thing to do, though? I was amazed. I just... Anyway, that, that's the end of the Jesse Owens story. Well, you had, um, when you were in school and, and came back and forth in the summertime, you were crossing the ocean on, the, I guess, the trans-oceanic voyages. There was no other way to come. <laughs> back, back in that day, it was your I'm, only option. Unless you went by Pan American Clipper. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have any interesting events that occurred uh, during some of those voyages? Well, yes, uh, several. You know, as, as a boy, uh, I was interested in sports, naturally, uh, fascinated by them. And um, I met several, several, I guess you'd call them celebrities now. But uh, the first experience I had was uh, I was playing tennis. I was in a table tennis tournament, uh, ping pong uh, tournament, uh, on the uh, promenade deck, and I had to go to the bathroom. So I went to the bathroom, and I looked next to the, I guess it's this hot water faucet, and there was this signet ring lying there. It was huge. I've never seen anything. I picked it up. I bet it weighed a quarter of a pound. And uh, so uh, when I got through, I went to the purse's office and took the signet ring to him and told him I found this in the men's room on the, on the uh, promenade deck. And the person said, well, thank you for bringing it back. And I went back to the promenade deck and I was watching the ping pong tournament. And all of a sudden, it seemed to me like it got dark. <laughs> the voice said, how do you do behind me? <laughs> I got up, turned around, and there was Max Schmeling standing there. <laughs> and, and for those that don't know, who was Max Schmeling? Well, Max Schmeling was the world, was the heavyweight champion and was on his way to the United States to fight Joe Lewis, okay. who so then... A boxing champion. A boxing, yes, yes, yes. And, and he was an enormous man, you know, heavyweight. Uh, and he shook hands with me, and I mean, they were this big. That <laughs> <laughs> was going to be gone. <laughs> and we never saw him again either. He, he didn't... Uh, fraternized with the other passengers or anything. He was just kept by himself. I don't know why, but that's the last we saw of him. Were there other events where you met other uh, famous or well-known people on your voyages? Well, uh, yes, one time. I don't know whether you're interested in sailing, but, but, but I love the water and I love sailing. And I've followed the America's Cup. Uh, and uh, the Challenger in 1937, I think, was Sir Thomas Sopwith from England. He was famous and got rich because he was the designer and builder of the Sopwith Camel, which was a World War I fighter plane that was, that was very useful to us 
in, in helping us to win World War uh, I. And the rule in those days was that, uh, that you had to cross the, uh, you had to get to the site of the race, which was where the last winner was. And you see, nobody had ever won the America's Cup. Vanderbilt had won year after year after year uh, after the first America went over there to accept the challenge offered by Queen Victoria, I think. And uh, so anyway, I uh, uh, ran into this man, very interesting. His name was Dr. Bounds. Uh, he was a, uh, a, a sort of a society doctor, had offices on Wimpole Street, but he was also the navigator for Sir Thomas Sopwith. And in those days, not like now, but in those days, they had these these big ships that were uh, gaff rigged, and finally, I think Marconi rigged. I'm not sure, uh, but they had professional crews on them, and maybe the owner would be on there when they were racing. Uh, and Sir Thomas, I mean uh, Dr. Bounds, uh, was the navigator. But of course, he couldn't leave his practice, so he didn't come when they brought the the Endeavour over here. Um, he was here, you know, like two months before the race, and invited me to, to come and be on, on, on Sir Thomas Sopwith's yacht to watch. Oh boy, <laughs> that's when my brother and I, the year that, a year when we came over by ourselves, I couldn't wait for the darn thing, it's a ship to get to New York. I ran down the gang, like, oh, Bob, Bob, <laughs> I've got a chance to watch the America's Cup. <laughs> please, please, won't you let me go? Because it was, you know, like end of September, and school started in England around the first of September. And I don't forget, he said, and now Junior said, you know, <laughs> that won't work. You have to be in school. So I wrote a letter to Dr. Bounds, and and uh, and and he replied, and sent me a photograph of of the yacht uh, that uh, that uh, Sir Thomas saw up with. Uh, had and of the yacht, of his motor yacht that towed uh, the uh, the sailing ship over here. The ship that was actually in the cup, though, was the Endeavour. Endeavour, yes, yeah, and and it was signed by by Sir Thomas Sopwith. Oh, I'm pretty proud of that. Now, did you also have a chance to meet uh, some tennis players on one voyage? Yeah, that was in 1939. as the last time we came over here uh, was right after Wimbledon. And uh, my brother and I were sitting in our compartment on the boat train. You know, they have a special train that takes you from London down to Southampton that meets the ship. And uh, here were these tennis rackets lying up in the luggage racks. And uh, you know, I thought, what in the world is this? You know, nobody else in there. And, uh, and, uh, after the train got started, first thing you know, in came the, the occupants of the other seats and um, found out that uh, one of them was um, Alice Marble, who won Wimbledon, and she was a tough old California broad, big girl, you know, and, and dyed hair. And another one was uh, Sarah Palfrey Fabian, and I fell in love with her. Oh, I thought she was absolutely wonderful. And, Followed around the ship like a puppy dog, you know. <laughs> the evening sat at her table and asked her to dance with me. <laughs> Did you end up getting that dance? She danced with me. She was very, very nice. She, and I think that's, that's all I can remember right now. Well, now the voyages that was something you did on a regular basis. How long would those trips across the ocean actually it take? It depended what ship you took. If you took the fast ships like the Queens, it'd be four and a half, five days. Uh, if you took the slower ships, it'd be six days. Uh, some of them, uh, we went uh, on the Hamburg American line sometimes, which is very nice, very comfortable. And that was seven days. They cruised at about 21, 22 knots, I think, versus the Queens who were doing about 33 knots. After you finished your schooling at the boarding schools that you told us about, you mentioned that you could have gone on to additional schooling in, in England. I would have. Uh, what did you do instead? Well, 
I didn't have any choice. You see, I, I, I planned to go back for the sixth form, uh, which would have been the year after the school certificate form. And then I planned to go to Oxford or Cambridge. Uh, and uh, then, of course, Hitler invaded Poland. So my father was planning to go back too, although I'm sure he had some doubts in his mind too. But <laughs> we stayed here. And, uh, and uh, I went to William and Mary and was accepted conditionally because, you see, they don't have, they don't have high schools and grades over there like you do here. They don't even have graduation like you do here. It, it's, it's a completely different world. Uh, but I didn't know whether I'd passed the school certificate exam. So I was admitted uh, to school at William and Mary provisionally. Uh, dependent on whether I, or not I passed the school certificate exam. And I didn't get the results until just before Christmas either. So, so unlike those of us uh, educated in the United States, you didn't have all the grades that they could look at. They didn't no, have any way to evaluate nothing. you. They had nothing. They had, they had absolutely nothing. And well, you see, they don't have they don't have graduation there like you do here. And, uh, uh, you know, you were in forms. The, the school certificate form was the fifth form, and then the sixth form, and then you go to the university. But there was no graduation or baccalaureate, uh, and you weren't an alumnus. Uh, that word was unheard of in England. You were an old boy. <laughs> and William and Mary didn't know exactly what to do with an old boy, I guess. Well, I didn't know what to do with William and Mary. That was the problem. I had absolutely no social skills, no experience, and and I had all these these surprises. I remember we were in the dining room. Uh, I've been there. The freshmen had to eat in the dining room and live in the dormitory, and uh, and uh, everybody was griping about the food. I thought to myself, "This is ridiculous. Most delicious food I've ever had in my life." <laughs> and, they made an announcement, said, all freshmen up in Phi Beta Kappa Hall for a pep rally. I thought, I thought what's a pep rally? <laughs> and we got up there. I went with the freshmen up on the second floor of Phi Beta Kappa Hall. And first thing, these girls came out there, W-I-L-L, cheering. I thought, good God, these wild Indians here. <laughs> you know, in England, if you hit a six, which would be like a, home run in baseball, you know, you'd say, shot. <laughs> that would be about the limit of you. <laughs> I guess we've heard the term English reserve, uh, where, where the English are very reserved, and that's, you didn't experience that going to William and Mary, much different atmosphere. Oh, oh, no, but you see, I, I had to learn. Uh, luckily, I was, uh, my roommate was, was Billy Cole, who was from Gloucester Courthouse, and he used to play with us down on the water, down, down uh, on where we had our summer house. So Billy, not much of a student, but he was socially very well uh, educated and very active. And so he taught me a lot of things. I mean, I got these invitations, these cards, you know, and said, you are invited to a smoker at the Phi Beta Kappa house and so-and-so at so-and-so. And I didn't have any idea what it was. I said, Billy, what in the hell? How come I'm suddenly so popular? He said, well, this is Rush Week. I said, what's Rush Week? <laughs> and I didn't know. <laughs> and so he explained to me. And uh, as a result of his, his guidance and, 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 and judgment, uh, I was pledged to K.A. And, and, uh, How did you end up at William & Mary to begin with? as far as picking that school versus some other school? Well, my father wanted me to go to Princeton or Yale. I didn't want to go there because I didn't feel I was equipped. I, you know, I, I just didn't. I, I was a foreigner. And I mean, the only thing that I had in common with the United States was the language, uh, the, the social customs and so forth. Uh, and, and so, I enlisted my Aunt Mary and my Aunt Evelyn Bird and my Uncle Jack. And uh, they persuaded my father to let me go to William and Mary. 
that that school at least was in an area of the country you were somewhat familiar with and felt yeah. a little more at home. Yes, yes. Now, how long did you remain at William and Mary? Well, I, I was there four years. That's where I met Mary Jane, my wife. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I, I'd learned enough that I got on the uh, orientation committee, uh, which was supposed to welcome the freshmen that came there two or three days early so as to be shown the ropes. And everybody wanted to get, well, all sophomores wanted to get on the uh, orientation committee so as to get a look at the new freshmen, <laughs> the women. <I> mean. <laughs> and that's where I saw, saw Mary Jane. So you met her uh, right when the she became a freshman? first day she was at school at William & Mary. So William & Mary, unlike uh, your prior education, was a co-ed school. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yes, yeah. dances and everything like that. And I saw the jitterbug. <laughs> oh. When, when, you, um, when you met your wife, who became your wife, um, you met her as, as part of your, your uh, involvement in that orientation committee. Well, yes, I saw her, and, and, and I met her, and I introduced myself to her, and, uh, and I asked her for a date that night. She said, I'm sorry, I have a date. I said, how about tomorrow night? I said, I've got one then. I thought, well, not doing much good here. I'll try again some other time. What, what, what is, uh, I, I of course know who Mary Jane is, but what is Mary Jane's full name? Mary Jane Riddick was her maiden name. She was from Portsmouth, Virginia. And you had not known her at all then until you met her at school? No, no. When did you two uh, become serious and know that it was something more? Oh, after two or three months uh, into the, my sophomore year, her freshman year. And ultimately, you two ended up getting married? Yes, we were married, and, and I couldn't get leave uh, to go to Portsmouth. Uh, I was in the Navy. Uh, when, did you, when did you enter the Navy? Um, I was in the V-7 program. Um, what is that? What's the V-7 program? Which, a good deal. They, they, they let you finish college, provided you made your grades, and then you went straight into midshipman school. And there, in four months, they made an officer and a gentleman out of you. So you were able to, um, through your agreement with the military, complete your schooling at William & Mary. Yes, yes. And then immediately started into your into military midshipman career. school. Mm -hmm. Had to go to Chicago, and I was there for, for four months. And then I had to report to a, to a destroyer escort. I was, it was built in Charleston, uh, South Carolina. And uh, we went for shakedown to, uh, to Bermuda, came back to Charleston, Christmas Eve, I remember, and then went into the Pacific through the Panama Canal. Went through one hell of a hurricane, I'll tell you. And, and I want to ask you about the hurricane. But um, before we get to that, let me ask you a couple of questions about the Navy and, and how did you end up uh, in the Navy as opposed to some other branch of military? <laughs> because I hate marching. I don't like to sleep on the ground. <laughs> I don't like to get cold. I thought at least until things get really bad, the Navy will be more comfortable. <laughs> and, and I love the water. I mean, you know, at Mitchman School, a lot of the things that... Uh, that they taught us, especially in, in piloting, uh, not celestial navigation, but in piloting. I already knew. I mean, you know, it was just... Well, and those of us that know you know that you uh, always enjoyed when you were growing up being on the water, around the water, yes. sailing very early. Yes. Uh, and, and continued to be somewhat of a sailor throughout your life. Yes. So I guess that was the Navy then a, a fit for you from the standpoint of a military? Wonderful. I loved it. I, I, I had a... I mean, I, I really had a good time in the Navy. I enjoyed it. Where were you when you heard about Pearl Harbor? <laughs> well, <laughs> I was manager of the um, box office for the William & Mary Theater, which was in Phi Beta Kappa Hall. 
and uh, this was on a Sunday afternoon. We had the box office open, and uh, business was slow, and they were rehearsing whatever play they were going to produce uh, in Phi Beta Kappa Hall. And um, I had this girl with me who was helping me, and there was nobody else around, and we were around the corner, and uh, uh, we were uh, necking a little bit, I guess would be a good <laughs> word for it. <laughs> and all of a sudden, we heard this screaming and yelling and everything. What the hell's wrong, you know? And I wiped the lipstick off, you know, and get straightened out. <laughs> We went to Phi Beta Kappa Hall. Said, "What in the world are you all screaming about?" That little radio with them, uh, and uh, they said the Japanese have bombed Pearl Harbor. I said, "Well, where is Pearl Harbor?" <laughs> no idea. <laughs> so that's, and that's that, that was in December. Then I had to go home and get my father's permission. I was going home for Christmas anyway. To the, he had an office in New York at that time and uh, went to Richmond to enlist in the V-7 program and almost didn't make it because I didn't weigh enough. They had a, a limitation on whether you could... The minimum. Uh, the chief who was doing the weighing, he said, uh, it's, it's, it's about lunchtime. He said, go across the street here. There's a hotel they called Ruger's. Go down in the uh, dining room and just eat all you can, and then on your way back up here, there's an Italian. He's got a banana stand. I said, buy some of those and stuff those down you all you possibly can, and then come up here and I'll weigh you real quick. So I did what he suggested. Came up there, I said, Chief, and we were naked, buck naked, too. You didn't have any clothes on at all. It was cement floor, God, it's cold. I said, Chief, I'm ready to be weighed. And I jumped on the scales. He said, you pass. And I kept on running, went to the men's room, I threw them. I bet, I bet if they'd weighed me afterwards, <laughs> I wouldn't have passed. Well, now, when you were in the Navy, what were your actual duties in the Navy? Well, I, I was, I, I think I was put on this destroyer escort just to get some training. I, I had no, no special, I, I wasn't a gunnery officer or the communications officer. But we had a communications officer on that ship who was lazy as hell. And he didn't like to get up at night. And he knew that I could work the electric decoding machine, which was very secret and, 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 and very clever the way it was arranged. So, you know, all messages came in. I ended up decoding them, even though I'd just gotten off off a watch, you know, it'd be two o'clock in the morning or something. So one night I was asleep and uh, a messenger woke me. He said, uh, Ensign Coleman, there's a, there's, a, there's a message for you to be decoded. And he gave me the, the piece of paper that had the message on it that the radio operator had gotten. And it was in five letter word groups and it was on a piece of paper that looked like a telegram. So I grumbled and cursed and so forth and went up the room where the decoding machine was immediately behind the bridge. And uh, you had to get into it like a safe. You had to twist the dials and the knobs and be right. And I got in there and closed the door. Hot as the devil. We were Espirito Santo, I think. And uh, so I set up the wheels according to the date and the time and everything. And I couldn't even type. So I had this five letter word group, you know. <laughs> and working on that. And finally I looked up and saw what the message was. And it was addressed to the ship, you know, compact so and so. It says, You are ordered to immediately detach Anson. And R. Coleman Jr. I said, that's me. I jumped up and down inside this little room. <laughs> when you say detached, that means you were relieved from that relieved duty? Relieved from that ship. And, uh, and, uh, and, and my orders were to report to Small Craft Training Center in Miami. And that's where I got my PT boat uh, uh, training. And you, you've, pointed, uh, you've pointed to your right 
We actually have a, a picture of that boat on the wall in the Coleman conference room, don't we? Yeah, that isn't exactly a, a PT boat. That's a, 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 a modification for a particular use that that boat was used for. But uh, I waited for transportation and finally got to San Francisco and then tried to find, find transportation and sent a telegram to the Bureau of Naval Personnel and asked for leave to get married and uh, send reply care of station master in Chicago. Well, it took about four or five days to get from San Francisco to Chicago and finally got there and found the station master and he looked like a turkey, a telegram sticking out of his hat, his coat pocket everywhere. <laughs> I muscled my way through a crowd. They all had the same idea, you know, and uh, finally told him who I was. I said, you got a telegram for me? He said, well, son, let me see. Finally found one for me, and I ripped it open, and I'll never forget the words of that telegram. It said, the exigencies of the service preclude granting leave. So I Bute purse. <laughs> I had to read it two or three times to figure out what it meant. <laughs> but anyway, I had to go to Miami. So Mary Jane came down to Miami and her family, and we were married down there. Before you left the destroyer, did you have a close encounter with a hurricane? Yes, 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 yes. Tell Not a close a encounter. We went right through the, right, right through the, through the eye of, of, the, of the hurricane. And so the, the destroyer you were on actually ended up having to go through the hurricane itself? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, we just left, uh, left Bora Bora, which is part of the Society Islands, uh, to refuel. And uh, we were on our way to, to New Mir. And uh, you sort of think of a map. Uh, I can't think of the name of the islands to the right. Uh, where the golf player comes from. Anyway, somewhere uh, in, in that area. Uh, Was that you know, Fiji? Yes, 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 yes. And we were to the left of that. Uh, we were, you know, seven, eight hundred miles from the Fiji Islands. And, uh, and all, you know, the, the Pacific is, is, is usually a beautiful color, blue, much, much prettier than the Atlantic, a completely different color. And, uh, and, and, and one morning, it, it got kind of gray and dark, and uh, the color of the water changed, so it got kind of gray and murky looking, and, uh, and the wind picked up, and uh, first thing you know, the waves increased. First thing you know, you had white caps, then you had spin drift being blown from the white caps. And our stupid captain, who by the way was an Annapolis man, but he hadn't gotten beyond the rank of lieutenant commander, and now I know why. <laughs> Forgot that <coughs> that north of the equator where we live, a hurricane moves counterclockwise. South of the equator, it moves clockwise. So, of course, the strategy is when you see this kind of a tropical storm uh, uh, approaching, if you're, let's say, we were south of the equator where it would go clockwise, you would turn left, and that would keep you on the fringe of the uh, hurricane, you know, so you go around it that way. Well, the captain, who was the senior officer in the, we had three DEs, and we were convoying four or five ships, including a, a seagoing tug that was towing a, a, a floating dry dock. Uh, he turned right, and, and that took us right right through the eye of the storm. About four hours on one side. I mean, it was hell. It was really hell. It took all the strength you had to hold on to keep from being slammed against the, the bulkheads and, and uh, knocked down. And uh, it, it was a, an experience I don't want to go through again. I mean, the ship would just go up in the air, and it, it just fall down, you know. And it'd just be covered with water. You'd be underneath water. And, and you'd think, well, we're gone, you know. And then all of a sudden, it'd start shuddering, come to the top again. And it, it did a lot of damage to the ship. It, uh, water was heavy enough. We had a splinter shields in front of our three-inch guns. Uh, 
you know, with steel to protect the men who were operating the guns. They, they were knocked flat with the deck. You couldn't have gotten a matchbook between them and the deck. Well, so your, your uh, notification that you were relieved from that duty probably came as a nice uh, change from the small craft. It wasn't long after that, yeah. yeah I was, and by the way, on the trip back to the United States, <laughs> I was standing at the rail, and we were watching the ship get up anchor and so forth, and there was an officer next to me, and I could see by his insignia on his sleeve that he was a chaplain. And he asked me, he said, do you like to play checkers? I said, sure. I said, well, why don't you come to my cabin and uh, we'll play some checkers before dinner tonight. So I went down there and, and uh, he was a, a, a Roman Catholic chaplain. And uh, he reached under his bunk, pulled out a bottle of Johnny Walker Black Label. <laughs> 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 and so we played checkers and then had dinner. So I wanted to reciprocate and I, I took a few bottles of liquor that that we bought in Panama when we went through there, but I just took the cheap stuff. I remember the, the, the brand, I'll never forget, it's called Agewood. <laughs> Next night I asked him to come to my cabin and I served him Agewood. For the rest of the 17 day voyage, we played checkers in his cabin. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I've got another story I wanna ask you about from your military career, but this is probably a good time to take a short break and then I'll bend your ear some more and. Thank you. Mr. Cohen, we were talking about your military career, and one of the questions that's come up is, what, do, what is a PT boat? What does PT stand for? It stands for Patrol Torpedo. And when you moved to small crafts, is that what you actually ended up on? Yes. Well, actually, I was ordered to uh, California uh, to train a crew and to go back to the Pacific uh, and on, on what was called a cub unit. What they did was go to an island and, and, and install everything, you know, airstrip, barracks, medical facilities, harbor and so forth. And this is all transported in a, in a huge convoy. And they were going to take my PT boat and my crew in that convoy. And we were going to be part of the uh, movement. Well, about, uh, I don't know, one long, three or four weeks before I was supposed to report to Port Wainimi for my boat to be put on a, on a cargo ship, uh, <coughs> I got orders to take my boat to Port Wainimi, this is in California, and deliver it to Port Wainimi and then report back to Small Craft Training Center. And uh, so I did, and we went up there, and I had a heck of a time finding somebody to take, to sign off for the boat, and I wasn't gonna just leave it there, you know. Binoculars be missing and Class B gear, you know, things like, like uh, <laughs> sextants and so forth. <coughs> so. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, it was about six, seven o'clock, and here was me and my crew just lined up on Highway 101. <laughs> this is the way we got back to uh, Small Craft Training Center in uh, in Los Angeles, and um, we stayed there for about uh, oh, I don't know um, three or four weeks, and I had orders to pick up a new boat. Now this was at the time when the Japanese were using the Kamikaze planes to bomb our fleet and they were terrified of them. I mean, these were pilots who were blessed by the emperor. They were, they were human bombs. They were locked in their cockpits, and you know, they just couldn't avoid them. So they wanted practice to, to, to handle these, uh, this type of an attack. And there was a very clever man called Denny, Reginald Denny, and he devised a target drone, uh, which was something that was launched off of a catapult, had a gasoline engine on it, propeller about this big, and you could control it by radio and make it do anything you wanted to. It was really amazing. And so they took the torpedo boat and took it to a shipyard at Newport Harbor in California. The shipyard had been making yachts for movie stars, 
<laughs> now they were doing, of course, Navy work, and uh, they took off all of the, uh, you see, there are no torpedo tubes on there. There are no place for depth charges to roll off. They put a catapult on the bow and uh, made several other modifications. And then I was a platform that took a crew from Santa Ana Naval Air Station that handled the plane and flew the plane. Uh, all I did was just take them where they were supposed to be. And uh, that's the way why it ended up such a strange shape. Well, now, on this duty, when you were involved in this, this part of your naval duty, did you have the opportunity to meet any uh, interesting or famous people? Yes. One t well, I noticed that uh, <coughs> there was this couple that was hanging out at the end of the pier. What we did was take over a, a, a fueling pier that had been used by, by uh, pleasure craft, by the movie crowd, you know, that kept their yachts in Newport Harbor. There, there was a big marina there for, for yachts. And, uh, and uh, so one time, one of these guys, he was wearing blue jeans. In those days, nobody wore blue jeans. And so was the woman with him. And uh, she had short hair down to about here. And uh, he stopped me and he said, uh, he said, what are you all doing? So I told him he could see, you know, the planes being carried down to the boat uh, and being placed uh, on the catapult and then on various other parts of the boat because we carried about five planes out there. Uh, he said, well, is it possible that, that we could go with you? And I said, no, I said that would be strictly against, uh, against Navy regulations. Uh, I'm afraid I'd get in trouble. He said, well, my name is Humphrey Bogart, and this is Lauren Bacall. I found out later on, Humphrey Bogart was still married and was living with Lauren Bacall on his boat down at Newport <laughs> Now, was this during the time that uh, there was gas rationing going on? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, he couldn't get a drop of gas. I was burning 120 gallons an hour <laughs> of high-octane fuel in uh, 24 cylinders. So, uh, I don't know, he talked around and I said, well, you got on blue jeans. And I said, you could put on a, a, a sailor's hat, couldn't you? And he said, yeah. And, uh, and then the sailor's hat's kind of a work coat, you know, that they put on that was made of blue jean material too. And, uh, and then I looked at uh, Lauren Bacall and I said, well, uh, could you get your head up, hair up, so that it'll stay up? She said, yes. I said, then we can put a sailor's hat on you? And she said, yes. I said, well, we don't have to worry about this. She was just as flat chested as <laughs> <laughs> And I said, we'll put a <clears throat> blue jeans and blue jean jacket on you. And, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and I'll take you, but for God's sake, stay out of sight because whatever ship we're operating with, there's going to be a lot of brass and they're all going to have their binoculars on us. Uh, and, uh, and I could get in a lot of trouble for, for, for this. So uh, that was that and it worked out and I wasn't put in jail. <laughs> well, now, when you took them out, this was before any of your legal career, but did you have them sign anything? No. <laughs> There was, uh, I, th I think there was a time, too, that you may have run into Errol Flynn. I didn't really run into him. This was after the war. <clears throat> now, the private pleasure craft were being uh, commissioned again and put into operation. And uh, the newspapers were full of Errol Flynn, who was commissioning his boat. I wish I could think of the name of it. I can't think of it, but anyway, all these movie stars and starlets and so forth that have gone beyond there, and uh, the day he was leaving Newport Harbor. So the day of the occasion, here came this thing just gliding down there, a beautiful, beautiful thing. Uh, the sailboat, two masts, uh, had a bowsprit, and uh, Errol Flynn was standing on the bowsprit holding onto the forestay, 
and kind of showing his profile to the world. <laughs> and and <coughs> just when they were a beam of where we would dock, and he almost fell off the bowsprit into the water, they ran aground. So, of course, my crew knew what was going on, and, and uh, they said, Skipper, let's go over there and pull him off. And I said, well, okay, let's see what we can do. Uh, and uh, so we lit off the engines and, uh, and, uh, and uh, went over there and asked them if we could help them. And I checked the tide tables and the tide was rising too. And uh, so I came alongside and I told them, I said, I, I want a bridle uh, and I want two lines leading to one line that I will lead to your boat so that I can pull you off because I don't want to pull the stern out of this thing with this huge thing that you've got here that's, that's the ground. So, uh, so uh, that's what we did and we pulled them off and it didn't take a whole lot of power to, to get them off there. They were just barely a ground. And, but I found out later on that, that my crew, that the, that the hand is faster than the eye You'd be amazed how many bottles of liquor they swiped off of that boat. <laughs> we were alongside not over five minutes, honestly. <laughs> well, how did your military career end? Well, it ended after the war was over with, and you had to have a certain number of points, which was based on the time that you'd been in the service. And, uh, and, uh, I was about ready to to be uh, discharged. You, did, you you weren't you weren't released from duty. You went into the inactive reserve, and I had this. Uh, I got this message from the admiral down in uh, San Diego, and he wanted to know whether I could meet with him on such and such a date. And I said, "Oh God, they found out about my taking." officers and wives over to Catalina Island. This was after the war on government gas and <laughs> snorkeling over there and having a wonderful time. <laughs> I was a hero up at the at Santa Island Naval Air Station. <laughs> and, uh, and so um, I replied that I could meet him and he said that transportation would be provided by air from Santa Island Naval Air Station to San Diego. So I went up to Santa Island Naval Air Station and there was a plane had the admiral's insignia on it and so forth. Somebody outside said, Lieutenant Coleman? I said, yes, step aboard. Mm -hmm. Pretty good. I stepped aboard and we landed at, at uh, San Diego and got off the plane and station wagon there. Another aide, you know, with all this epaulets on him and so forth. Mm -hmm. Lieutenant Coleman, yes, step aboard. And took me to the admiral's uh, office. And the uh, admiral was very nice and we made small talk for a while. Then he said, we're having trouble retaining um, men in the Navy. And, uh, we just wondered whether you'd be interested in a naval career. We're willing to give you a jump in two ranks from Lieutenant JG to, uh, to uh, Lieutenant Commander. And we'll put you in command of a DE that's stationed here in, uh, in San Diego. What's a DE? Yes, it was a DE, not mine. <laughs> what, what, what is a DE? Oh, a destroyer escort. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, <coughs> so I told him, well, I've already applied to law school and uh, I hadn't even thought about a naval career, but give me a few days, would you please? And I could call you back. I need to talk to my wife about it. And he said, I understand that. And he was very kind. He was very understanding. And I called him back in two or three days and, and uh, decided to go to law school. And the reason I went to law school was, was just a cop out. I mean, I didn't have a job, I didn't have a skill, I had nothing, I was married, you know. And I said, my good golly, I'll at least put it off for two years and, uh, and, and the GI Bill will pay for my uh, room board and, I mean, room and tuition and they paid me, I think, $90 a month. And uh, that was a lot of money in those days. I think the rent I was paying was something like $30 a month. At the point that you actually applied for law school, did you know any lawyers? No. Did you know anything about really what the legal profession did? I had no idea. I had no idea of being a lawyer. But after I'd been there about <clears throat> two or three months, 
I was absolutely, I, I just fell in love with the, with the, with the, uh, with the discipline. Why did you uh, decide to apply to law school as opposed to trying to go into business, same kind of business your father was in or something along those lines? Uh, Jeff, you know me well enough. You know that I'm not a commercial person. I mean, I, I just knew that, uh, that, that I, I wasn't made uh, to be a salesman or to be in a commercial. I, I really wasn't. I, I, I should have gone on, on stage or <laughs> in a trial lawyer. <laughs> but my dad asked me about it several times, and, and, uh, and, uh, and my brother was, was, was going to go into business with him. And, uh, and uh, it wasn't long after he went to work for him either that the TB showed up and, you know, became very active. And When you say TB, you're referring to tuberculosis. Yes. And so that prevented him from going into your father's oh, business. Oh, he couldn't be around tobacco and all that dust and everything, no. You ended up at what law school? At, as Foster Arnett would have said, <laughs> at Mr. Jefferson's school <laughs> at the University of Virginia. How did you select that law school? I thought it was the best law school in the country. I'd taken some law courses at William and Mary. Uh, I'd taken constitutional law under Dean Cox, and I'd taken contracts uh, under, uh, I've forgotten his name, um, uh, a wonderful professor. And I was able to transfer those hours to UVA. And how long was your law school? At that Two time? years. I, I, I went year round and took the bar exam. You could do it at that time in Virginia after one year. Uh, so I went, started in the fall, went fall and spring. And then there was a break there, and I was going to go to summer school. And in between the break, uh, they gave uh, Dr. Woodbridge, that was the professor I'm thinking about, he came up there to Charlottesville and gave the cram course, and then we went to Roanoke and took the uh, bar exam. And you won't believe this. I don't know how much you paid for, 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 for the cram cor course that you took to prepare you to take the bar exam. It was expensive. I don't remember the exact amount either. I think it's, it's $1,000 now from what I hear. Dean Woodbridge came up to Charlottesville for two weeks, charge zero. And so you actually took the bar exam then before finishing law school? Yes. Did you pass it? Well, I didn't know. <laughs> we didn't know until, uh, until uh, December. Uh, and uh, we could leave a, a telegram and pay for it, prepay for it where the Board of Law Examiners would telegraph the results to you, or you could wait to be notified during, by normal channels. Well, on the day that the telegrams came out, uh, all this excitement and some sadness, and people got a telegram, and they failed, and others that passed that were cheering, I got nothing. And Mary Jane and I were waiting, and <clears throat> looking for the Western Union guy to come up on his bicycle and <laughs> bring a telegram. <laughs> nothing happened. I got absolutely nothing. And so I was really depressed. So we waited for the uh, midnight train from uh, Richmond to uh, Washington that took the uh, newspapers and mail and other stuff, and they dumped the uh, Richmond newspaper, uh, just threw it off of the train at the Charlottesville station. <coughs> <laughs> and in it, it had the bar exam results. And uh, I found out that way that I'd passed. So you never got a telegram actually telling you you had passed? And there's a law in Virginia, and I found out about that, that failure to, develop, to deliver an intra-state telegram entitles you to, <clears throat> to a fine of $50. And I went down to the telegraph, I made an application for that $50, and I got it, and I bought myself a whole suit with it, a gray flannel suit. <laughs> so you had your first professional suit to be able to use as a lawyer. That's that exactly point. right. 
Did you go ahead, I think you didn't have to, but did you go ahead and finish your law school? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And then what did you do after law school? Well, I started looking for a job. Uh, I tried around Tidewater in Norfolk and Portsmouth. Uh, but at that time, it was kind of a, this was in 1948, I think. Uh, there was a slight depression, and, uh, and uh, a lot of the law firms had sons that were going to move in there, and it was just, there just weren't any jobs available. And so then I went to New York and was interviewed by some of those huge firms here, you know, Sullivan and Cromwell and so forth. And uh, God, the more I saw that, the more depressed I got. And I was telling my father about it. He said, Nancy, would you like to practice in a small town? And I said, yeah, that's what I'm looking for. He said, well, why don't you talk to Mr. Clyde Austin, and the Austin Company, the tobacco dealer here in, in Greenville. Uh, said, he's in New York, and this was, oh, about the beginning of December. Uh, and, uh, and so um, he and his whole family, and they were staying at the New Yorker Hotel. So I called Mr. Clyde, and uh, he said, well, come on over and have breakfast with us. So we had breakfast, Mr. Austin and his wife, his oldest son, Tom, and his wife, his son, Bob, and his wife, and his son, Frank, and his wife. And we just had a great time there, just joking and laughing and so forth. And finally, I told Mr. Austin what I was doing in New York, and that I was very depressed because I didn't like anything that I saw. And he said, well, why don't you think about Greenville? He said, I don't have much business, but I'll help you all I can. I said, well, Mr. Austin, where is Greenville? <laughs> so anyway, uh, we came in, Mary Jane and I packed all of our worldly goods into our car, and there was lots of room to spare, believe me. And we spent the uh, first night at the Bromley Hotel here, and uh, on the second floor where Judge Bromley furnished the rooms with his antiques. And uh, we just barely gotten settled. The telephone rang, Mr. Austin. And Nat, are you settled? Yes, sir. He said, uh, we'd like to have you come for dinner tonight. Could you come? I said, yeah, we'd love to come. We'll come around 7 o'clock. So it's 7 o'clock. Mary Jane and I went over there. Guess who was already there? Judge George Taylor, Estes Kefauver, and my father. <laughs> <laughs> so Mary Jane and I joined them, and we had a nice evening. And that was my introduction to Greenville. And you must have liked what you saw about Greenville and elected to stay? Yes. Uh, Did you initially set up a practice uh, by yourself when you came to Greenville? Yes, yes. Uh, there wasn't anybody hiring here at that time either, uh, even Mr. Milligan, uh, who was very nice to me. And, and he, was, he was like a father to me, and so was Mr. Clyde Austin. And uh, they gave me a little business, but... Uh, I got an office. I couldn't even afford a secretary uh, up on the second floor of the Green County Bank. And, uh, and uh, I used to get Mary Jane to call me. I said, I want other people here to think that I've got some business here. The telephone ringing. Otherwise, it's very, very quiet here. <laughs> but <coughs> I did income tax returns. You know how much I got for a return? You won't believe this. Three dollars. Three dollars for an income tax return and a farm return, which meant that the farmer would come in with a brown paper bag uh, and had his year's receipts in there. So you had to do his accounting for him and then f fill out his tax return. Got five dollars for that. So that was the beginning of your legal career in Greenville? That, that was the beginning. How did, your, how did your career then change from starting out doing income tax returns to what it later well, became? I had, I, I, I had some luck somewhere. I got some clients. Uh, uh, one of them was Hamlin and Allman that had uh, worked night after night after night in the cold winter uh, repairing a, a shovel that was used by people who were using at a, at, a, at a stone quarry. And it was very hard limestone, and the teeth on the shovel would get worn out, so they had to be repaired or replaced every night. And, um, and they were never paid. And, you know, they were owed like about $12,000. Uh, 
So they employed me to try to collect that for them. And, and uh, so I got judgment and attached the shovel. And I got the Noel brothers, who were also in the construction business, to hotwire it for me. And we walked the shovel from the quarry site down the road, tore down telephone wires, <laughs> electric wires above us, <laughs> parked it in the county garage until it was sold. And uh, John Bohannon bought it for $10,000 at auction. And he paid Miss Lucy McInturf, who was the clerk and master, 10 $1,000 bills, which was still in circulation at that time. Well, at some point, did you become what was uh, commonly referred to as a trial lawyer? Yes, uh, I don't know what a trial lawyer is, but I, I had, uh, and I was lucky. I, I, I had a lot of uh, work to do for for, for uh, manufacturers here. You know, we represented Magnavox, and they had a lot of labor law, a lot of trouble, problems with the union. Uh, and uh, gosh, that, that gave us a lot of business, uh, both trial work and and uh, negotiating uh, negotiating uh, collective bargaining agreements. And, and so on, and, uh, and uh, then Jay, as he got older, Jay Milligan, uh, gave me more and more trial work to do. And what was his full name? Jay, Jay Milligan, what was it? Was it, was it James or? No, Jay, J-A-Y so was his J -A -Y. name. So J-A-Y. Yeah, okay. yeah. And, and he, of course, was before my time, but... Uh, yeah, long before your time. <laughs> Do you remember your first trial experience? Well, the first case that Jay sent me on uh, to try was up at Mountain City. Uh, I don't think he wanted to drive that far. Uh, and uh, it was a small personal injury case, and it was before... It was in the old courthouse in Mountain City, which was made out of wood. Uh, it burned down, and it's been replaced by a, a brick structure now. But I went up in that, uh, when I, I met first with my client, who was a country boy, uh, and then went up to the courtroom, which was on the top of the uh, wooden building, and uh, the officer was sitting there, and he was shoveling coal into a pot-bellied stove, and, Stovepipe went up through the ceiling. That was the only heat we had. And the judge sitting here and the witness here, the jury here, and there were, of course, no women on the juries in those days, and uh, the clerk sitting over here. So <clears throat> I put my client, a big chin, you know, and he's wearing galluses. <laughs> I said, State your name. And he went, rum, 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 rum. I said, Look, you've got to speak out, said the judge and the jury and everybody here wants to hear what you've got to say. Now speak out. He said, now state your name. He said, rrr, 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 rrr. I got a little impatient. And I kind of yelled at him. I said, speak to the jury. And he turned around and said, howdy, boys. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, how long were you actually on your own practicing law in Greenville? About two years. Did you, st had, once you settled in Greenville, did you stay in Greenville? Mm hmm Yep. How did you end up uh, then going on and, and becoming uh, a firm or becoming part of a firm? Well, I worked for Jay Milligan. And uh, <clears throat> then uh, uh, we took Herb Silvers. Well, I was actually sharing office space with Herb Silvers. And Herb came up there, too. But Herb didn't last very long, and uh, the firm just grew from there. Uh, you mentioned that part of your work that you did over uh, the course of your career uh, at some point involved uh, some of the labor types yes. of cases. Were those dangerous situations? Some of them were, especially the Wildcat strike down at, uh, at, uh, at uh, Jefferson City. Magnavox had a plant there about 1,200 people, and they had a wildcat strike that walked out. And uh, 
So uh, I had to take care of that and get an order from the chancellor to limit picketing to two at each entrance to the plant and that sort of thing, so as to try to avoid violence. And uh, I got my fight from the chancellor in Sevierville. Then I'd get back to Dandridge, <coughs> file the papers with the clerk and master, and uh, I could see all these faces peering at me from behind pillars and obstructions and structures, and I said, now somebody's following me. <laughs> oh, I was scared. <laughs> so I got the papers filled out, and I asked the clerk and master, I said, where's the sheriff's office? He said, right behind where we're sitting. So I called the sheriff. I said, Sheriff, I said, I represent the Magnavox Company, and I think I may have some problems here. Could you give me an escort out of town, please? He said, sure. He said, describe your car. And I said, I did. He said, we'll be waiting for you. And so I left the front of the courthouse and went up the hill to the light to turn right to go to Newport, and then we have gone from there to Greenville. And sure, there was the sheriff's car, and he followed me. Well, after a mile or two, I noticed the sheriff's car had gone. I guess he thought there's nothing wrong, and I don't need to go any further. So about 10 minutes later, I saw these two or three cars behind me, and I knew they were full of people, and I knew that they, they, there was trouble there. So I went faster, and they went faster, and I went faster, and they were faster. I was going 100 miles an hour when we got to Newport. Anyway, they broke off the chase at that point, and that was the end of that. As your legal career progressed, uh, what did you see as far as the camaraderie of the attorneys or how the uh, legal profession interacted with each other during that day and age? Well, it was great. I guess when I first came to Greenville, there were maybe 15 or 16 lawyers, I'm not sure. And how many are there now? 50 at least. <clears throat> and the lawyers, we'd, we'd, we'd fight like the Dickens in, in court. Um, but afterwards, we eat lunch together at the uh, front table at the Brumley Hotel. And, and uh, we'd uh, socialize, and, and we were courteous to each other, and a good feeling. Your practice, um over a period of time, how did it evolve as far as the types of cases that well, you did, those types of things? Well, <laughs> I did a little bit of everything. Uh, I guess I got away from, uh, from, uh, from union work and then corporate work and got more and more to, to, to litigation and uh, did a lot of uh, civil rights cases. Uh, and uh, and um, finally ended up uh, doing a lot of medical malpractice work, and I imagine the last oh, 12, 15 years of my career, 70 percent of my of my practice was was medical malpractice, which I enjoyed very much. Working and practicing in a in a rural area like Greenville, uh, did you ever consider? going to a bigger city or practicing in a bigger city? No. Why? Well, and that's the thing. Did, did you think that Greenville offered you the, the opportunities to do what you wanted in the legal profession? Well, you know, I didn't have any, any, any great, uh, I don't know. I was satisfied with, with what I was doing, although I was gone a lot. I worked late. I, I, I never came home before 7 o'clock, sometimes 8 o'clock. I was traveling a lot. Uh, I worked hard. I couldn't have had anything more to do, and, and it just took up all of my time and all of my energy, and, 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 and I enjoyed it. I, I, I just really, really enjoyed it. Well, and, and as part of your practice, did you have to travel around various parts of Tennessee or even out of the state? Oh, yes, yes, yes. What, what required you to do that as part of your practice? Well, to take depositions. Uh, when I was representing Magnavox, uh, I had to go to New York, I had to go to Fort Wayne, uh, uh, just whatever the case required to uh, interview uh, uh, experts, 
to hire experts uh, and take depositions of the plaintiff, maybe who, I don't know, and just, just on the road all the time. One thing that's a little unusual about uh, a, a city the size of Greenville is the fact that it has a federal courthouse. How did that impact your practice? It helped. It helped. As a matter of fact, <laughs> I remember one of the first cases that I had, this was before I was with Mr. Milligan, you know, the, the, the farmers and country people here hated TVA uh, because it took their valuable bottom land, covered that with water, and, and they despised them. And so I had this small tract of land, this farmer who objected to his land being taken. Uh, but the case ahead of me was, was, was being tried. And in those days, the uh, TVA condemnation cases were tried by a judge without the intervention of a jury. They were tried by the, uh, by the uh, attorney general or one of his uh, deputy's assistants. And they had this landowner on the witness stand. Uh, and boy, he was mad. You could just tell it. <laughs> he sat up on the witness stand. <laughs> he said, and then this TVA man came on my land. And boy, the attorney general thought he had him. He said, how'd you know it was a TVA man? He said, because he's wearing a hat, carrying a briefcase, telling a pack of lies. <laughs> said, Judge George Taylor looked over. Any further identification necessary, counsel? <laughs> <laughs> so that was my first introduction to, to the to federal court. Well, we've all uh, heard stories about different cases and their their favorite cases, uh, but I've heard of a, a story about a case where you actually sang at, <laughs> to the jury at one point. Tell us about that case. Well. This was a case when Judge Todd was on the bench, and Judge Todd hated motorcycles. And it was in the 60s, you know, when the long hair and motorcycles and, and the lack of discipline first uh, came to the fore. And uh, these two kids on a motorcycle, this happened on Easter Sunday morning, uh, were flying down old 11E. And uh, this family had just left church, and they were going home to Grandma's to have Easter dinner, and they turned left, had this signal on, and the boys didn't see him and just ran into the side of the car, just T-boned him, you know. One went 20 feet this way, and one went 30 feet this way, and the motorcycle hit a tree about 10 feet up in the air. So we tried the case, and uh, on the second night, the, uh, everything was finished except the closing arguments. So Judge Todd, adjourned court and told the jury and the lawyers to come back next morning for closing arguments. So that night I came home and uh, the children, you know, they had a record player and, and they blared it. I mean, it was just so loud, it was awful. And it drove me nuts. And I was taking a bath, trying to think about my closing argument, and they were playing a, a, a song, the, the Honda song, uh, uh, on the record player. And at first it was too loud, and then all of a sudden, ah, here's an idea for a closing argument, if I can get away with it. <laughs> so, so the next day uh, it came up, my turn to, to close, and so I approached this very stealthily too. <laughs> I said, now, I don't know whether any of you all have got children that are the age of mine, uh, between 10 and and, and, and 13, <clears throat> uh, but if you do, you, you, you're familiar with, and sick probably, of a song that tells the story of this lawsuit. I looked around at Judge Todd, and he was just looking down and then I said, it's called the Honda song. I said, it goes something like this. First gear, hang on tight. And I looked around at Judge Todd. <laughs> Second gear, it's all right. Faster, faster, faster. <laughs> well, the attorneys for the plaintiffs got up, went to the bench, took a non-suit. <laughs> and that was the end of that. And I thought they wouldn't be, they'd be too stupid to file the case again. Damn, they didn't file it again. So in the middle of the trial of the next case, 
same facts, you know. One boy went so far this way, well, the ones, well, another one went so far this way, the motorcycle went this way. Judge Todd from the bench said, hee hee. He said, one flew east, one flew west, one flew into the cuckoo's nest. <laughs> that was the end of that case. <laughs> well, as your, as your cases changed, how did you end up doing some of the civil rights cases? I guess you know how there weren't any civil rights cases filed when I first started practicing law. I mean, people just wouldn't think of suing the government or the, you know, a sheriff or a branch of the government, and it was just something that was coming into vogue, and more and more of them were being filed, and uh, we represented uh, one of the carriers for many of the uh, municipalities and, and political entities uh, that were named as defendants, and so that's the way I got to. I know there are, are, are tons and tons and tons of stories that you have about other lawyers, judges, uh, and I've, I've wanted to focus with you primarily on, on you, but uh, you mentioned Jay Milligan. Uh, were there other attorneys that, as far as you coming up in your legal career really were mentors or meant a lot to you as far as how you learned to practice law? No, not really, other, other than, than, than Jay Milligan and uh, somebody who was very kind to me and associated me in, uh, in many cases <coughs> was Jack Daddy uh, from Knoxville. Uh, he was with a a firm, Hodges, Dowdy and Carson, and they represented lots of insurance companies and did lots of trial work. But um, but uh, Mr. Hodges had about quit and was busy uh, watching his stocks, and uh, Mr. Carson was about the same way, and Jack was left by himself. And so Jack was kind enough to associate me in many cases, and this was before he hired uh, Bob Campbell. Uh, but uh, I remember one case he associated me involved the birth control pill, and you know at first it was uh, it was it claimed that it caused heart attacks, uh, and uh, I remember we had to go to uh, to New Jersey I think to the headquarters of the company the manufacturer, and uh, after we we took a took a two day course on how the pill was developed and how it was made and so forth. Very interesting. And then I got back and <clears throat> I decided to check on what other medications this woman was taking. She was buying her drugs at Bull's Gap Pharmacy. And uh, I got a subpoena and went to, down to the Bull's Gap Pharmacy. Damn if she wasn't using a different brand of birth control pill, not the one that she sued. <laughs> So I called Charlie Terry. I mean, you know, lawyers wouldn't do this now, I don't think. And, and I, I just told him, I said, Charlie, you got the wrong bear by the tail. Uh, I don't know how you got a hold of the defendant or how you came to the conclusion that manufacturer X that you've named as a defendant, that this woman used that product. Uh, but, and I talked to Jack about it, of course, before I did this. Uh, but I said, we're willing to settle this case with you and pay you a little money. And, and, and he appreciated it. And then after that, Jack associated me in many cases. And then when he, when he um, hired Bob Campbell, I still did a lot of work with him. Uh, we, we had lots of interesting cases together. And I'd associate Bob Campbell down in, uh, in Knoxville when I had cases down there. You've obviously seen a, a large period of time uh, involving the legal profession. What are some of the things that you've seen as far as major changes in the legal profession? Well, one is this, uh, this business about uh, mediation. Uh, I think that the uh, American College of Trial Lawyers has a very interesting study and article about the 
trial of civil cases becoming a lost art because of mediation. Uh, and uh, I don't know, I, I never, you know, I discuss settlements sometimes, especially if it was appropriate and, you know, if I was not on very sound ground, but, uh, but uh, other than that, I, it's a shame. I, I, I think <clears throat> lawsuits ought to be tried. Well, and you certainly tried a number of them in your time. Uh, how often were you trying cases back in the, the heyday? Oh, lots and lots. Lots and lots and lots. And, and a lot of them were, you know, I mean, one time I had this case where this woman claimed that my client's dog got into her yard and scared her, scared her daughter. And uh, I took a discovery deposition and I mean, you never heard as many problems as this daughter was having. She couldn't stand puppies, she couldn't stand dogs, she couldn't stand even stuffed animals. So I thought, well, this, this woman's exaggerating, there's something wrong here. And uh, so I had a friend that loaned me a little teeny dog, and I said, meet me in the courthouse, put that dog on a leash. And this woman testified, and it came my turn to put on the witnesses, and the daughter was sitting in her mother's lap dressed up like Queen Victoria. You never saw anything like it, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> so I went to the door of the circuit courtroom. Judge Hall was on the bench at that time, and I grabbed the leash and brought the dog in there. And this little, this little girl, she's three or four years old by this time, hey, mommy, mommy, look, look, look at the pretty puppy. <laughs> <laughs> well, the end of that lawsuit. So there were some big ones and some little ones. And, and uh, we were often associated by in big cases uh, involving, you know, like uh, Eastman and uh, companies like that, uh, by lawyers from, from, from the big cities uh, to be local counsel. In those days, to, in federal court, you had to associate local counsel. I don't think that's true anymore, although I'm not sure. Well, and you ended up being associated on some cases that uh, I guess made national news at one point. I'm thinking of a, the, the textbook case. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, we weren't associated. We, we, we started with that case. So you were actually lead counsel in that case yeah, at some yeah. point? Yeah, we were lead counsel in that case. Mm -hmm. That was Vicki Frost. And, and what was, tell us just a little bit about that case and what it... Uh... Well, it was a stupid case. It was one of these fundamentalist uh, women. Uh, she was the, uh, what's the famous painting of, of, of the two people that have Puritan hats on standing with their, with their, Yard tools. Uh, I can't think of the name. And I, and I can't either. She, she and her, and her. <coughs> she and Ameri was it American Gothic? Well, that was the style. But what was the name of the painter? Uh, the the one that drew the uh, the. Uh, th they looked exactly like that. Honestly, was it was that Grant Wood? You ex exactly right. It was Grant Wood. I didn't know you knew that much about art. <laughs> I've, I've, I've got some helpful helpers. Because uh, <laughs> you know me well enough to know I know nothing about art. <laughs> but anyway, we, we won the case on motion, first go around. And uh, uh, then, and then I've forgotten how it came back to the federal court. Do you Judge recall what the, what the claim was relating to the, the textbooks? The textbook, yeah, that they, uh, that they wanted their children to be excused uh, from classes that taught uh, that, uh, that Christ, uh, something about biblical references. So the, the textbook at issue had some biblical reference in it, and they wanted to prohibit their child from having to read yeah, that. Yeah, to, to, the, to the birth of Christ, and they wanted to prohibit that and excuse the child from, from that. And which side were you on in that case? Well, we were representing uh, uh, Hawkins County, the school board, and, uh, and we won the case, and then it came back for some reason, I've forgotten. Uh, and when it came back, the people for the American Way had gotten into the case, and they hired this Washington, D.C. law firm, and they just injected themselves into the case without ever, without ever discussing it with us or anything. First thing we knew, there they were. 
So we were glad to have their help. And, and that, that was one of the earlier cases, I think, where the contents of textbooks became an issue. And, and right, 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 one of the first. Right, oh yeah, it was all over the news, and, and they'd call me, these news programs would call me, and, and uh, hell, they brought an NBC crew or something in my office, and all this wire and, and television <laughs> stuff and so forth. <laughs> you know? Did you see a, a, an impact on the legal profession from some of the, uh, even in a small town like Greenville, from some of the events that were occurring, like the Civil Rights Movement? Uh, or the women's movement? No. Greenville was sheltered to some extent from some of that? Very much so. We, we had no... We, in the first place, we had a very small uh, colored population here. And they were all very well liked and had, had good steady jobs and uh, had their own school when I first came here. But... Um, uh, same with, with, with women, they, there was no discrimination, I mean, we... Other than the, the changes that you saw over time and the progression toward more of the mediation mindset, were there uh, other significant changes? I know technology has changed the law quite a bit. Well, yes. Uh, <clears throat> I couldn't practice law now. I mean, I don't know how to use all these new instruments. And, I mean, it's over my head. I just. I've got a computer at home, and I don't have any idea how to use it. None. <laughs> well, when you, I, I know you started out by yourself, been into practice with Mr. Milligan. Uh, how did the, the firm Milligan and Coleman really come to be what it is uh, today? Well, we needed help. We had lots of business, <clears throat> and so we found people that we liked. Uh, it was the, was the first to come with us. And uh, he uh, clerked for us during the summer. And then when he was through uh, uh, law school, he came to work for us as, as an intern. Uh, and then later on as a partner. And uh, next was Tom Kilday. And I'll never forget, he was trying to case with me and his baby was due. And he whispered in my ear, said, the baby's coming, and left the courtroom, and there I was by myself. <laughs> but, and then you came along, and, and um, I enjoyed working with young lawyers and taking them with me and trying to give them the experience and also <coughs> the, the, the courage to, to do things by themselves. And this way, I think that we developed some good lawyers here. We had some, I mean, you know, they, they were apprentices, but unless you give them the opportunity to show themselves, they, they never will learn. And uh, I think you drove many a mile with me and probably heard the same old sorry stories over and over and over, but you were very polite. You laughed every time as though you'd never heard it before, Jeff. <laughs> you wouldn't have made partner if you hadn't done that. <laughs> well, the, those that have, have litigated uh, against you uh, know you to be a very aggressive, hard-charging attorney. Uh, those of us that have worked with you, especially those that have worked with you at the law firm, uh, have seen a different side of you. How are things actually done inside Milligan and Coleman as far as, uh, as, far as making decisions? Um, very important, we, very informal. <clears throat> We'd have partners meetings. I impose one rule, and that is that the decision had to be unanimous, not a majority. And that worked very, very well. Uh, we never had any misunderstandings. Um, we had one bad apple that we hired, and that didn't turn out well. But, uh, but um, that's it. Uh, we, this has been a, a very close-knit uh, group, and 
it's been a joy, you know, to to to, to work with them. I, I just I just really appreciate every single day I had to work with you guys, and um, I wouldn't do it any other way. And I never got into politics except one time. I was. <laughs> I was at a meeting of the, you know, when I came from Virginia, uh, and Mary Jane and I moved here to Greenville, we'd never seen a Republican, and we'd never seen anybody drink scotch. And the reason for that was that politics in Virginia was controlled by the Byrd machine, B-Y-R-D, the family that I'm related to. My grandmother was a, was a Byrd. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and people were too poor, they had to drink scotch. Because the tobacco business here, People had more money here. I mean, everything you see in Greenville, the roads, the courthouse, and everything was paid for with tobacco. And so the legislature had, had, had uh, uh, commissioned a limited constitutional convention to amend the Constitution. And uh, the Democrats needed a delegate. And George Malone, I'll never forgive him. It <laughs> suggested that I do it when well, I'd been here maybe two or three years. And I thought, well, maybe it's not a bad idea. It'll get my name around and I'll get known. And Herbie Hartman helped me uh, meet people and so forth. And my opponent was, uh, was a lawyer by the name of Leon E. Easterly. And he was short and fat and pompous. And he, he said, yas, yas. I don't know where he got that from. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, we ran, and, uh, and, and I beat him in the city, but he beat me in the county. And so the next morning, I was walking down the post office, and I saw him getting ready to go up to his office. And I thought, I'll jump across the street and congratulate Leon. I went over there, and Leon said, I want to congratulate you. Uh, you did a good job running, and you'll do a good job when you go to Nashville. Uh, good luck to you. And he stuck his belly out at me, and he said, Yas, Yas, Coleman. And I must say one thing. I'm surprised at the number of votes you got. <laughs> on his heel, went up the steps. <laughs> That's the last I saw of him that day. And that, I guess that was the last of your political career. That was the end of my political career. <laughs> well, now you retired in about, uh, was it 99? 1999, yes. Um, and you made a decision at that point, at, at that point of, of why to retire. Tell us why you decided to retire at that point. Well, I'd practiced exactly 50 years. And I thought that was enough. And I'd seen too many lawyers that didn't retire in time. I mean, not necessarily because of age, but you know, some people, their mind ages quick, quicker than others. Uh, I'll never forget a lawyer from Johnson City uh, he was a fine lawyer in his time, but I mean, people just, you know, their eyes rolled in the back of their heads when he came into court. He was real short and his arms were too long. He carried a briefcase in there, cleared the floor by about this much. <laughs> but I decided, uh, 50 years is, is enough. I don't want to be a burden on the system or on the courts or on my partners or anything else. And, and, and I retired, and besides, uh, you know, I, I love the water, and, 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 and I wanted a boat, so uh, we sold our farm here and, and got a condominium here in Greenville, and we got a condominium in, in Norfolk, uh, and it, it was just perfect. We could go down in the basement, walk across the garage, open the door, and there was a pier, and there was my tide up there. and so. You know, life was, 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 was beautiful for a year and a half, and Well, and you had an, an un, unfortunate event that occurred at that point that um, brought you back to Greenville. Yeah. And that was um, Mary Jane actually had a stroke, didn't she? Very serious stroke. Uh, and as a result, you, you moved back here and... Uh, Permanent, I mean, everything. We, we, we just had to sell the apartment in, in, in Norfolk and, and sell the boat. And you and she had been married how long? Sixty-four 
years, I think. I don't know. And you've got, uh, you got. She, 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 her stroke was, was so bad. She has no short-term memory at all. Uh, she has just a teeny bit of long-term memory. She's got the mind of a four or five-year-old. She can't count or write or anything like that. And uh, let that be a lesson to you. Don't put off everything until the golden years. Because you just never know what's going to happen in those golden years. Do the things that you love to do and you enjoy doing now while you're healthy and can enjoy them. And that, My golden years lasted a year and a half. And that's probably an excellent point to take a, a short break. <laughs>